The season five finale featuring the Cybermen took Doctor Who for the first time to a place which had rapidly become a science fiction staple in the preceding decades, a space station. Doctor Who had already explored some of the key science concepts of the day, such as routine space flights and a permanent base on the moon, but until The Wheel in Space, there had been no mention of the kind of artificial orbital habitat which would become a key part of Earth's real-life space program almost exactly three years later. But whose idea was it really to include a wheel-shaped space station in Doctor Who? Why did this donut design suddenly seem to be everywhere in science fiction at the time, and is there one particular contemporary source which has hidden links to the wheel in space? Do the scientific concepts in the story worsen its already poor reputation, or perhaps redeem it? The prop used was not designed and built for Doctor Who, so what were its origins, and what prompted this redesigned version on the Target book cover? There are enough questions to make your head spin, so let's unravel the mysteries of The Wheel in Space. Terry Nation and David Whittaker took very different approaches to writing space adventure stories for the Doctor Who TV series. Whilst Nation's scripts featured ships which could travel between star systems at impossible speeds, vast war fleets and weird aliens, Whittaker favoured a more realistic approach, and he had invented the more grounded space colony subgenre of Doctor Who in Power of the Daleks, in which the base is not only under siege by monsters, but troubled by its own internal affairs. Nation had let his imagination fly, setting a story in the year one million and dropping in extraordinary feats of planetary engineering, whereas Whittaker's sci-fi plots were steered away from this Dan Dare approach by Innes Lloyd and Jerry Davis to be based on real science in the near future, touching upon the nitty-gritty of having the correct power supply or the practicalities of astronaut food. And it's with that mindset that Whittaker took the wafer-thin storyline he was given and valiantly attempted to find ways to make it fill six episodes. Consequently, the script for The Wheel in Space goes beyond a cursory attempt to add space jargon and includes some astonishing scientific detail. For example, when the crew are first observing the arriving rocket called Silver Carrier, Tanya Lernoff thinks she sees it drifting slightly, but Ryan disagrees, saying, Now, now, the movement isn't real, it's just an illusion caused by slight polar precession. Polar precession is when a rotating object wobbles, causing the north and south poles to move around. So Ryan is saying that because the wheel wobbles on its axis, the top and bottom of the space station have a circular motion. This means that if their sensor equipment is mounted at the top, then stationary objects would appear to move back and forth compared to the stars, giving the false impression of drift. It doesn't matter if the audience knows all this, as it just sounds like technobabble, but it's a remarkable detail to get right for a throwaway comment. But let's not be in too much of a rush to offer a gold star for astronomical excellence, since this script also includes a cyber scheme to blow up stars in order to nudge some nearby rocks towards the space station. In reality, even if one of the nearest stars to Earth went supernova, it would take a century for the shockwave to reach Earth. The star which goes nova in the wheel in space is so far away it would be utterly inconsequential. But despite scoring no points for accuracy here, it does provide the opportunity for jeopardy and action in a story which is not otherwise filled with incident. We can't be absolutely sure who contributed the different elements of the hard science in the final version, but scriptwriter David Whittaker was certainly a diligent researcher. It's unlikely anything came from the utilitarian story editor Derek Sherwin, but the other contributor was the man who came up with the storyline in the first place, Dr. Christopher Magnus Howard Pedler known as Kit. Pedler was an optometrist at the University of London, who was interviewed for, and subsequently paid to, take the position of scientific advisor on Doctor Who in 1966 and 67. Along with the story editor of the time, Jerry Davis, he provided the storyline for The War Machines, which dealt with the dangers of computing, but most significantly, he created The Cybermen. It's no coincidence that The Cybermen were always tied in to space-based stories, 
As Simon Gurrier points out in The Scientific Secrets of Doctor Who, the concept behind these creatures came from a paper published in 1960, in which Manfred E. Kleins and Nathan S. Klein outlined that it would be more logical to change human bodies to meet the requirements of extraterrestrial environments rather than trying to make an Earth-like environment out in space. This paper saw the first ever use of the term cybernetic organism, and by grafting life support systems to human bodies, it would allow astronauts to march through inhospitable environments and even spacewalk without supplementary help. Therefore, the early Cybermen stories were deliberately set in locations which showcased their physical superiority over humans, where they could brave hostile temperatures or survive without air. The fourth Cyberman adventure would do the same again, having the Cybermen spacewalk without the need for suits, and poisoning the oxygen supply with a cunning bit of chemistry to turn O2 into O3. The oxygen will turn into pure ozone, the humans will die. The story again followed the base under siege format with Peddler's space-based bias and Whitaker's colonial interests colliding to provide a new setting to trap the troubled human protagonists, a space wheel. From Peddler's outline, David Whitaker would then flesh out a working sky station as a multifunctional base of operations out in space. In his script, Whitaker simply refers to it as a man-made space station, which he says hangs in the cosmos, an outpost of humanity. The only physical description is, in its name, the wheel in space, but where did Pedler get the idea for this shape? In 1929, Slovenian rocket engineer Herman Potochnik was the first to envision a rotating wheel space station. His detailed concept, seen here, shows the reason for this design. With the whole structure spinning, the astronauts would be flung out from the center due to centrifugal force. It's not a real force! But as long as there's an outer wall to stop them disappearing into the distance, they are pushed back towards the center of rotation, thanks to the opposing centripetal force. When viewed in cross-section, the occupants would seemingly be walking on the walls, except for in the center of the structure where people could float. German rocket scientist Werner von Braun referred to this work when he published his own concept for a rotating wheel space station which appeared in Collier's Weekly on the 22nd of March, 1952. His proposal was to make a structure from flexible nylon, which would then be inflated like a car tire. Four months after this magazine came out, the concept was featured again in the work of an upcoming writer named Arthur C. Clarke. Despite von Braun beating him to publication, Clarke's manuscript entitled Islands in the Sky had been completed earlier However, it wasn't released until July of 1952. Clark's book documented human settlement in space, and it described a residential space station as a great wheel with an axle spinning to create normal Earth gravity at the rim. Then, in 1954, a friend of Clark's from the British Interplanetary Society got in on the act. An amateur astronomer and aspiring author by the name of Patrick Moore co-wrote a juvenile novel called Out Into Space. The cover, depicting a torus-shaped space station, was illustrated by Patricia Cullen, who would not only illustrate Moore's later books, but provide the diagrams for his television program The Sky at Night, where he found fame three years later. But despite Clark and Moore's fiction, it was Werner von Braun who rapidly cemented his association with the space station shape when he appeared on a Disney TV episode called Man and the Moon in 1955. The program was widely seen, and the design was later turned into a Disney-branded model kit. In 1956, Patrick Moore revisited the concept as he churned out another science fiction book for children called, quite remarkably, or possibly not, Wheel in Space. It described itself as the amazing story of how a satellite was built in spite of treachery and danger. The cover was another painting by Patricia Cullen. Researcher Simon Gurrier points out that interestingly, in later years, Apollo astronaut Edgar Mitchell spent a week sharing a house with Arthur C. Clarke and rocket scientist Werner von Braun, and perhaps if their acquaintance started even earlier, maybe they had discussed these ideas together. The acclaimed 1957 Soviet film Road to the Stars showed a wheel-shaped space station, and the production even went to the trouble of building the appropriately curved floor, which would be characteristic of the internal corridors. 
This film was groundbreaking in its use of special effects and it was highly influential. So by the late 50s the ring donut design was fully ingrained in the public consciousness and it cropped up more and more frequently in science fiction. Fans of Doctor Who first encountered it in the Dalek book published in 1964 which was significant because it was also written by David Whittaker with a little help from Terry Nation. But soon people started to forget the science that had generated the shape. Films would include a wheel shaped space station simply because that was now the de facto design which the audience had come to expect. But without referring to the spin being used to create gravity. An example of this was in Mutiny in Outer Space in 1965 which had curved corridor sets but the characters inside are walking on the flat floor. Whereas the whole point of the shape is that the spin of the wheel flings objects outwards towards the curved walls. This all may explain the general dissemination of the wheel shaped concept into the public consciousness, but how specifically did the idea infiltrate the Doctor Who production office? There are two extremely tantalizing possibilities, both of which may have played a role. The astronomer Patrick Moore who wrote his novella Wheel in Space in 1956 was one of the men interviewed for the post of scientific advisor to Doctor Who. Is it possible that he might have used his book as part of a pitch of ideas when trying to impress the production team and could this idea have fed back to Kit Peddler after he successfully secured the post? But probably the main influence was one particular looming cultural artifact which not only got the science right in terms of the wheel shaped space station but cast a long shadow over the media landscape of the time and seemingly blended with Doctor Who in numerous ways. The use of centripetal acceleration to create gravity within a wheel was famously depicted in the Stanley Kubrick film 2001 A Space Odyssey, written with and adapted from work by Arthur C. Clarke. In the docking sequence which introduced Station 5, the rotation is shown in majestic fashion and inside we see the structure's curved floors. Later in the film aboard Discovery we get another look at what it's like to experience this kind of artificial gravity with these extraordinary scenes shot on a cylindrical set. During 1966 actor Robert Beatty shot his scenes in the film including those set on the wheel shaped Station 5. Following his work on the motion picture he was then cast in the first Doctor Who Cyberman story The Tenth Planet co-written by Kit Peddler. Is it possible that during the production process, perhaps when the actors chatted during rehearsals, that Beatty spoke to some of his colleagues about the extraordinary movie production he had just worked on that featured a wheel in space? Kubrick completed the work with his actors in September 1967 and then focused on the remaining model work for the following months. During the shooting of 2001, Set visits were conducted for press and the executives were shown a sizzle reel before production finished. So along with the likes of Robert Beatty spreading the word, it's likely that news of this ambitious production was filtering out within the industry during the autumn of 1967. Given all that was happening at the time, it seems to be more than just a coincidence that in December of 1967, Peddler just so happened to produce a Doctor Who storyline called The Space Wheel. And is it a coincidence that in the final script for The Wheel in Space we are told that the Silver Carrier is a supply ship destined for Station 5? Despite the 2001 film having had a four year head start, Doctor Who's hectic turnover meant that there was a photo finish for the two productions Space Wheels getting in front of the cameras. Kubrick completed his miniature effects for 2001 at the exact same time that director Tristan Devere Cole and his team were filming this material for The Wheel in Space in late March 1968. It was also a dead heat for the production's respective releases as both 2001 and The Wheel in Space reached UK audiences simultaneously. Kubrick's film had a budget of around 3 to 4 million pounds with which he could realize his space wheel from scratch using cutting edge photographic effects work. For Doctor Who however, it was a slightly different story. So where did the low budget television version of this space wheel 
actually come from. The responsibility for providing the model for the wheel fell to Bill King of the Trading Post, but his company was a prop store as well as being a prop maker, and their first port of call was always to scour their warehouse for an item which might perform the necessary function before anything was built new. In search of a wheel-shaped prop, they came up trumps with this existing item. It was a symmetrical space satellite named Icarus, built to be the ultimate weapon, or so it was to be reported in the newsbenders. The model itself was built by Michael John Harris, who also worked on Doctor Who. The Newsbenders was the final live broadcast episode of 30 Minute Theatre, which went out in January of 1968, whilst The Wheel in Space was still being written. Seeing the model in colour, and in good clarity, invites a couple of observations about it. Red is not a typical colour for a space station, but it evokes the industrial feel of heavy-duty oxide paints seen in Earth construction projects, which, by another amazing coincidence, is exactly what Stanley Kubrick was aiming for in the colour of the skeleton sections of Station 5, which was shown to be under construction in the film 2001. This intricate framework added extra detail and therefore a sense of scale to the model in Kubrick's Space Odyssey. The Icarus satellite model also has an intricate framework to the same effect, but here it offers support to what we take to be the firing components of this orbital weapons platform. Coincidentally, 2001 also features an orbital weapons platform. This 30-minute drama additionally featured a lunar lander model, which would later appear in Doctor Who in Professor Eldred's museum in the Patrick Troughton story The Seeds of Death. After the live shoot of the newsbenders was completed, the Icarus prop was returned to the trading post, where it was stored for two months until it was rediscovered for use in Doctor Who. To function as the space wheel, it was decided that the top section would be removed and the curved end cap at the top of the body was replaced with a faceted section which had circular porthole windows added to sell the idea of human habitation. To complete the transformation, the body of the space station was resprayed silver, although the ring was left in its matte beige colour. The revamped model was ready to go in front of the cameras as part of the third day of pre-filmed sequences. These were captured on the 21st of March 1968 at BBC Television Centre Puppet Theatre in White City, London. The sets, which were designed by Derek Dodd, betray no hint that he contemplated the wheel shape in which they live, and although there are no curved floors, at least there are no curved walls, so he didn't fall into the same trap as, to name another example, the Ark in Space. But actually, we can take the flat corridor sections and have a little fun imagining how the shape of Station 3 would be built to utilise the spin of the structure. There is nothing on screen which contradicts this layout, so we can enjoy giving the wheel in space the full Stanley Kubrick treatment. My gut feeling about the size of this structure, as shown here, produced a diameter of about 180 metres and a capacity for comfortably homing several hundred people. This feels about right to me compared to these other large vessels. But I know what you're thinking. You're going to pull me up on the fact that we can actually work out the diameter of the wheel by observing the speed of its rotation on screen and applying this formula to work out how big it must be to create Earth gravity at the rim. And I can tell that you've done the maths and you've realised that at the size I've suggested, it doesn't create Earth gravity. Well, fair point, but I would argue with you that to increase the wheel in size so that its on-screen rotation is correct for Earth gravity, that would make it improbably large. It would have capacity for tens of thousands of people, and that feels wrong to me given that this story is set in the near future. So can we make it a sensible size and not completely ignore the speed it's spinning? Well yes, how about we acknowledge the gravitationally bound elephant in the room and note the line of dialogue in episode 1 where the Doctor points out the silver carrier has an artificial gravity unit. No spinning needed here. Well, where are we? It looks like the motor section of some sort of rocket. Rocket? Oh yes. This is an artificial gravity system too. 
What does that do? What's, what keeps us on our feet? Otherwise we'd be floating around. The animatic you're seeing here is part of a shot-for-shot -shot reconstruction I created, lasting over 10 minutes, of the first episode of The Wheel in Space. I'm not an animator as you can clearly see, but I wanted to follow the camera script precisely using a perfectly accurate reconstruction of the set, which was modelled by Rhys Williams. I'm going to continue working on this as a side project whilst also undertaking a photorealistic reconstruction of another missing episode using a different method. You can support both these ongoing projects and see progress as it unfolds by joining my Missing Episodes Reconstruction Patreon, for which there is a link in the description. So my suggestion would be that engineers found the perfect balance, whereby the wheel spins at the maximum speed that doesn't disorientate the crew or hinder docking, and the rest of the gravity is topped up using an artificial generator. The spin is still useful because it reduces the power consumption needed for the generator and also guards against power failure, which would be an operational nightmare. So if the origin of the wheel's design is grounded in hard science, can we apply the same logical scrutiny to the orbital location of the Station 2? Can we answer the question of where exactly the wheel, designated W3, is supposed to be, other than in space? During a conversation about the planet Venus, Duggan and Zoe give us the following information. I just like flowers. Hey, that one comes all the way from Venus. You imagine that? All those millions of miles away? 24,564,000 miles at perihelion and 161,350,000 miles at aphelion. This all sounds very technical, but what is Zoe actually telling us about the distance to Venus? Perihelion is the term given to an object's closest point to the Sun in its own orbit, and aphelion, which Zoe mispronounces, is the term for the object's furthest distance from the Sun. So there are two ways we can interpret what she says. The first is a very literal reading of the technical terms. Zoe could be saying that when the planet Venus is at its closest point to the Sun, then the wheel comes to within about 24 million miles. And when Venus is furthest away from the Sun, then Venus and the wheel are separated by as much as 161 million miles. This would put the wheel in a highly elliptical orbit, ending up nearly twice Mars's distance from the Sun. There's nothing to directly contradict this in the story, but applying these figures in this way makes them just random numbers and it leaves the wheel in a strangely lopsided and arbitrary circuit around the Sun. It may be literal, but it's not logical, nor is it elegant. But there is a second solution, and one which makes a great deal of sense. The unfortunate caveat is that Zoe has used the two terms perihelion and aphelion incorrectly, but writer David Whittaker and his advisor Kit Pedler make up for the error in their attention to detail when planning the real-world orbital mechanics of the wheel in space. The more elegant solution I'm about to propose takes into consideration something very conspicuous about the distances Zoe stated. So let's ignore the mislabeling of these figures and focus instead on what they actually represent because the numbers are not arbitrary at all. These figures are very specific measurements in our own solar system. 24,564,000 miles is the closest that the planet Venus and the planet Earth ever come to each other. And 161,350,000 is when they are furthest apart, measuring each to their opposing side of the Sun. It would be a stretch to believe that these two precise numbers are included by coincidence. So in the context that the conversation is about how far away Venus is, there is only one logical way to interpret what she's saying. Zoe is saying that the wheel's closest approach to Venus is 24.5 million miles, and at its furthest point it's over 161 million miles away. These are of course the same numbers shared with Earth, but that does not mean that the wheel is in orbit around the Earth. In fact it can't be because the station is said to be a halfway house for deep spaceships. The wheel can in fact be at any point in Earth's orbit in order to share the same relationship with Venus. So with this entire loop around the Sun to choose from, is there any particular spot which is a more likely location? Actually, there is. 
because the real-life space agencies of Earth have discovered something remarkable about gravity surrounding planets, and this has come in very useful for parking probes and telescopes out in space. Thanks to a weird quirk of the way the fabric of the universe operates, the interplay of gravitational forces between any two large bodies in space creates five points of equilibrium in every planet's orbit. These are called Lagrange points and act almost like indentations in space, providing stable pockets into which smaller objects can more easily settle. Every planet orbiting the Sun has five Lagrange points in its orbit. Two of Jupiter's, for example, are demonstrated by these two accumulated clouds of asteroids, which sit just ahead of and just behind the giant planet. So if you were going to park a space station somewhere which shared Earth's orbit around the Sun, then it would be within one of these five Lagrange points. In astronomy, these points are each numbered, with 1 and 2 being near to Earth. L2 is where the James Webb Space Telescope is currently parked, not in orbit around the Earth like Hubble, but one million miles away. L3 is on the far side of the Sun, L4 is ahead of the Earth in its orbital path, and L5 is in its wake. L4 and L5 form an equilateral triangle with the Earth and the Sun, and L3 is at 180 degrees. Therefore, three Lagrange points form half of a hexagon created by these angles of 60 degrees. If the wheel was to function as a halfway house, the most logical position for it would be in its furthest possible distance from Earth. This evidence all points to a location on the far side of the Sun, a conclusion which fits perfectly with the numbering of the space station, as it just so happens that this would place wheel W3 in Lagrange position L3. This would make it a useful stopping off point for any journeys within the inner solar system. If you've gone on a flower picking expedition to Venus, then as Zoe points out, at its closest, the planet is only 24.5 million miles away, and at the same time, the Earth could be nearly seven times that distance. You might think it's a stretch to believe that this much thought actually went into the wheel's location, but there is another key piece of information provided which seems to prove that the station's role was meticulously planned by Whitaker and Pedler. Because the wheel is not unique out in space, it is designated number 3, and we are also given information about station 5. In fact, we are given enough information to determine exactly how close these two space stations are, and once again, the numbers are not chosen at random. We're told that Silver Carrier is said to be 87 million miles away from where it should be, so therefore we know that its correct course would have placed it at some point on this ring. And at the time it deviated from this course, it still had 7 million miles to travel before it reached its destination. So we add those two figures together and it tells us the distance between the wheel W3 and Silver Carrier's planned destination. It was on course for the aforementioned Station 5, which we therefore know is 94 million miles away from Wheel 3, somewhere along this ring. And as it happens, 94 million miles is another number which has not been chosen at random by Whitaker and Pedler. It's a very relevant number in our solar system. It is roughly the radius of the Earth's orbit around the Sun. And if you recall, the Lagrange points L4 and L5 each form an equilateral triangle with the Earth and the Sun. Therefore, the distance from the Earth to each of the two Lagrange points is also 94 million miles. And furthermore, if we add the two extra points to complete a hexagon, then 94 million miles is the distance between any of these six points on the hexagon. So if we all agree that Lagrange point L3 is the most logical position for the wheel on the far side of the Sun, then station 5, said to be 94 million miles from the wheel, would land on one of the points of the hexagon. And since we know there are five stations, then the perfect explanation is that there is a ring of stations, each with an orbital radius of 94 million miles, each 94 million miles apart, with the Earth occupying the sixth point on the hexagon. This belt of stations tallies with the dialogue in the script about the Silver Carrier's course, it lines up with the distances Zoe gives to Venus, and W3 would successfully operate as a communications relay, 
using the other stations to bounce signals around the sun. The only drawback is that Zoe is being clumsy, to be generous, with her use of the terms perihelion and aphelion, but since she mispronounces one, maybe there are gaps in her knowledge, and we'll just have to overlook it because the rest fits so neatly. Perhaps this analysis will always be incomplete because of the four missing episodes that are depriving us of visual clues. For many people, the first opportunity to enjoy this mostly missing adventure was in the Target novelization, which was released on the 18th of August 1988. It was written by Terence Dix, and its cover features a different version of the wheel in space to the one seen on screen. The cover artist for this book was Ian Fraser Burgess, who kindly supplied us with this draft concept for his artwork, which shows an earlier version of his wheel design and the Cybermats floating into the foreground. The final version, as seen on the cover, has a distinctive design using spherical shapes which he tells us was likely to have been inspired by the then recent movie Moonraker and comparisons to this design shows there is definitely a similarity. So the wheel in space broke new ground for Doctor Who, setting it in a new and futuristic environment which would become the backbone of real life space exploration in the following decades. Its inclusion in Doctor Who seems to be the result of the most famous early depiction of a space wheel, and it's neat that the book shows an alternative version from a different genre. The Wheel in Space may not be the most loved Doctor Who story, but it attempts to tell a true science fiction story without drifting into the realms of fantasy, a testament to Doctor Who creator Sidney Newman's intentions to inspire and educate.